And now get ready because in part 3 of the tutorial we're going to be exploring some really exciting and advanced techniques that will take your not toy knowledge to the next level. So we'll build the lighting strikes on the ground that appear once in a few seconds and you should consider this part as an advanced tutorial where we'll need to use a bunch of different notes to achieve this look and to keep the tutorial short I'll try to go slightly faster compared to our initial introduction to Noet Toy while trying my best to keep things as easy as possible and I've talked too much already, let's get to work. Alright, let's start with the basics. I've created a new material and the master node is set to unlit and transparent. I've also selected the plane mesh in the preview section and now let's go back to the beginning of the shader and explain what's happening here. These two sections are equivalent to each other, as in the output of the world position node is the output of this combination of nodes below it or at least that's what I expected. Unfortunately, at the time that I'm making this video, the world position node seems to have a strange bug that is causing it to return incorrect values. It does work under certain conditions, but not for the shader I was trying to create. So what we'll do instead is to recreate the functionality of the world position node by using this setup right here. We don't really have to go in depth on explaining what these nodes are doing, and it's likely that the bug will be fully resolved by the time you're watching this video. So for the time being, just pretend that these scary boxes right here are just another way of getting the output of the world position node. Great, now that we got that part out of the way, we can focus on this part of the shader, which is generating this strange ring that we're seeing on the plane. After getting the world position, I'm using a length node to calculate the length of the world position vector. If you think about it, if we calculate how long is the world position of each pixel, we're basically getting a measure for how distant they are from the center of the 3D world. Each side of this plane is two units long, and if we start from the center, this line will go up to one. And here we're showing how far away each pixel on the green line is from the center. Every pixel up here is very close to being 0.75 units away from the center and if we subtract 0.75 units from that value, as we're doing with the subtract node, we'll get a number that is very close to zero. And this explains why all the pixels in this area are getting darker. The apps node will transform the output to a positive number by flipping negative signs, so visually our end result will be a measure of how far away every pixel is from the 0.75 value that we're selecting in the subtract node. And this little trick can create a ring of pixels that end up being darker in this mesh. And we can change the radius of the ring by updating the value that is being used in the subtract node. So for example, if I set it close to 0.5, as we expected, that's the ring that we get as an output. And now I'll introduce the if node, which is a node that I really love because it gives us the option of running conditional logic in our shaders. And the if node looks very complicated, but in reality it's not. So it takes as an input two values, A and B. In this case, we're using a constant, which we'll use for the ring size and then the, abs the absolute value that we were using before to display this result. So we are going to take these two values and then do something depending on a condition between these two values. So if A is greater or equal than B, as it's defined here, we'll output zero at the other side of the node. If A is smaller than B, we'll output one, and that will generate the result that we're seeing here. Again, let me try to explain this visually, what's happening. All the values that are closer to the dark side of the ring will be very close to zero. And the further away you move from it, the higher the number will be because absolute will always return positive values. So what we're doing here is setting a constant for which all of these values, all of these pixels, if they are greater than 0.1, then the output will be zero. But all the values that are close to this edge, which are smaller than 0.1, will turn out as white because we're setting the value 1 if a is smaller than b. And as you can imagine, if we change the value that is being compared with the output of the absolute node, the bigger this value will be, then the thicker our ring will end up being. 
And it would be great if we could also change the radius of the ring over time. So what needs to happen is that this value that we're feeding to the subtract node will need to grow until it goes out of the screen. And actually, let's try. We could do it here by using a bigger value. So if we let this value grow like this and then go back to zero again, then we would have a nice animation to have an expanding ring over, over time. And thankfully, it's super easy to get that effect by using a time node. This node will basically start a counter that continuously grows over time. And to constrain the output to a specific range, we can use the remainder node to determine what the animation will look like. So in this case, the timer node will continuously go from zero to free, which is the value that we're specifying here in the remainder node, and then start again at zero, thus creating this beautiful animation that we see here on screen. And I've made another small adjustment. Now I'm using a default white color as the color of this material, and I'm turning it into a transparent material by setting the output of all of our shader to the opacity slot of the master node. So every point that is not inside the ring will now be fully transparent. We're getting very close. One of the important parts that we're still missing though is that the original effect didn't show just a generic ring. So it was instead animating a set of lightnings. What we could do now is pick a black and white texture that shows some lightnings and make sure that the pixels inside the ring remain white only if they are also white on this texture. And one way to do that is to create a texture sample in Node Toy, pick the output of the if node, multiply it with the red channel of the texture, and hook up the results on the opacity slot of the master node and remain in awe when we see how cool the animation looks like if we filter the ring's interior with a cool texture. But the values that should be opaque don't have to be pure white. We want in fact those values to get the original color of the ground of the 3D scene and make it look way brighter and much more saturated. And doing that is as easy as creating another texture sample powering it by six and multiplying it with a large number before sending the result to the color slot. You might be wondering though, this is definitely not the texture of the ground. And this texture is definitely not the texture of the lightnings that we had in our FreeJS scene. And that's right, at the moment I think the free version of Node Toy doesn't give us the option of importing custom textures. So we'll change these two textures in code after we export the material. But before we can do that, we need to change the values of a bunch of nodes. So for example, the scale of the time node, we have to set this to 10, the remainder to 45, and the ring size to 1.85. After applying these changes, the preview section will not gonna make any sense at all, but that's completely normal, don't worry about it. As soon as we export the material and import it in our project, it will look perfectly fine because these are the values that work well with the dimensions of the scene that we have in 3JS. Great, now we can export the material, same identical process that we followed in the last video. I'm choosing self-hosted, making sure the React tree fiber is selected, then going over the shader data, and we can either copy the shader data or download it as it is. Back to VS Code, here's the file with the shader data. I call the sparkle shader and placed it inside the source folder. And I also changed the value of these two properties. So the value of the first uniform is the value of the texture of the ground. And whatever value was in here previously, feel free to delete it and replace it with this one. Same goes for this uniform. This one will be the value of the lightning's texture. And then inside scene.jsx, I've created a new mesh that is identical to the one above it. We're using the same geometry for the ground element of the scene. And I'm using this time a node, a node toy material. I'm setting the sparkle shaders as the data property and make sure that the node toy material that you're importing is the one from React node toy. And finally inside app.jsx, we have to import this component, which to my understanding is the one that controls the timer. And that's very important for our animation because it runs on it. And make sure again that you're importing the one from React node toy. That's it, we're done. Take a look at this beauty. 
This will close the note toy chapter for this project. I hope I managed to at least explain the general idea of how this shader works. And even if the effect by itself looks simple, there's a good deal of stuff that you have to know before you can actually create it. So definitely pat yourself on the back if you were able to follow the entire process and understand the inner workings of this shader. There's definitely much more that we can do with note toy and I'll try to get back to using it for future projects since the interface is super simple and being able to preview the shader output is really convenient for this kind of projects. So I hope you had fun on this one. Stay tuned for the next part since we'll create the beams of light emitted by the meteor. And thanks for watching everyone. I'll see you next time.